Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Dear listeners, today we bring the story of a woman who cheats on her husband and later in life gets karmic justice. Let's start. The musty smell of the waiting room did nothing to quell the sickness in my stomach. I looked around and then back down to my feet, wondering what I was really doing here. To my left sat my beautiful wife, Rachel. She looked as radiant as ever, a beauty that never left me without butterflies. To my right sat my daughter, Jasmine, who, in many ways, was my savior. My thoughts drifted back to the day I met each of them. I was a different man back then. Mr. Grin's voice called out, bringing me back to the room. We will be ready for you in around 20 minutes. The other witness has just taken the stand. I nodded. It would be the first time in over a year that I would come face to face with my ex-wife, the woman I was married to for 12 years of my life. But since then, so much has changed. I will start from the day my life changed forever. It was a normal spring day in Albany, New York. I was returning home from my customer accounts job at the local Albany utility company. I hated the job and had pretty much been forced into it by Jessica, my ex-wife. It is more secure and financially rewarding, she would say. It is better than construction, was usually the next comment. I should have known earlier that all she seemed to care about was money and social status. I do not want to say too much about Jessica other than, at 35, she was still the most beautiful girl in the world to me. She was smart, funny, and loved me to death. From the moment we met, I always thought she was out of my league. I was working construction back home in the Bronx when we met. I was tall and quite good-looking with a permanent tan from always being outdoors. From the moment we began dating, we were always together. I was her protector, her entertainer, and she saw past my lack of academia and only seemed to love me with more passion. When she finished her master's degree, we moved back to her hometown of Albany and eventually married. Her parents were not thrilled by me at all, and they made no attempt to hide their dislike. Both they and her old friends felt she was too good for me and wondered why she would marry beneath herself. I was a good-looking dumbass, according to her father. Nonetheless, we were happy and loved each other more than anything. I was an only child, and both of my parents had died in my late teens, so Jessica became my whole world. I found a job in construction, and Jessica got a very good job at a finance company owned by a friend of her father's. When the recession hit in 08, I lost my job, and it was Jessica's salary that pulled us through the bad times. This only succeeded in making her parents love me more, if that was possible. It did put a strain on our marriage. Well, I guess it would when the people you love and socialize with tell you that your husband is a loser. Sadly, it also affected my friendships back home in the Bronx. I was now moving in different circles, according to them, of course. My best friend, Joey, was always there for me. He was more like my brother, and his folks helped me through the loss of my own parents. It was Jessica who managed to convince me to take the job at the utility company. Like I said, I hated it, indoors, computers, talking to people on the phone in a fake voice. It was my idea of hell. But I made the effort for Jessica, and first, we both had to have children one day. But having a successful career and being seen to have one was more important to Jessica. Image, wealth, and status really did not bother me. But I did everything Jessica wanted, and I even tried to become the person Jessica wanted me to be. Sadly, when you stop being yourself, things tend to go downhill, and you eventually become an unhappy person. I was no longer the chirpy Bronx builder who loved to have fun and be around people. I became depressed. Most days, I put on weight stopped grooming, and rarely socialized, if ever. Yes, I was an overweight office worker married to a successful financial analyst who attended fancy dinners and cocktail parties with the Albany elite. I was not one of them, they knew it, and I knew it. I pulled into our driveway and was surprised to see Jessica's car in the garage. I got out of the car and walked over to the house with a feeling of impending dread. I did not know why, but as I entered the kitchen, Jessica sat at the table, looking solemn yet assured. There were some papers in front of her, and as I was about to speak, she cut me off. Mickey, we need to talk. Those famous words hit me like a ton of bricks. I could see she was slightly nervous, but as I sat down, I saw no tears. What is it, babe? I asked. Everything okay? She steeled herself, cleared her throat as though preparing for a big speech. I am sorry, Michael but I want a divorce, she stated clearly and calmly. My heart sunk, and my stomach nodded. 
I was speechless as it felt like someone had reached into my chest and grabbed my heart. That horrible feeling of sudden loss that I have experienced twice before is the worst feeling you can ever imagine. I looked at her and, with a tremble in my voice, managed to speak. But why? I stuttered. I have fallen in love with somebody else, she said, looking at me with no sign of pity. I was shattered, but strangely, I did not feel shocked. The old Mickey Green would have caused havoc, but he no longer existed. Jessica had seen to that. I was a shell of the man I used to be, and here she was finishing me off with a final swipe of the sword. How long? I said huskily. For months, she said as I just stared at her. But now I want us to be together and get married, she declared with no thought for my feelings. I was looking at a woman I no longer recognized, and in reflection, she was looking at a man she no longer recognized. I don't want to know the details, but I do want to know why, I said finally, afraid of what her answer may be. She wasted no time in answering. Just look at yourself, Mikey. You are not the man I married. You were overweight, unshaven for years, and when was the last time you had a decent haircut or purchased new clothes? She said in a flurry of what must have been long pinned up feelings. You're a shell of that man I fell in love with, and let's be honest, you have never been on my intellectual level, have you? She said in a mocking tone. God knows how many times in the last decade I have had to defend you to my parents, friends, and colleagues. Justified to them why we married in the first place, she continued, and suddenly, I wondered where the girl I fell in love with had disappeared to, and who this heartless creature was sitting before me. And rich, I mean my new man, is younger than you, fit, attractive, and has a successful business and a big house close to mommy and daddy in Loudonville. Every new word she spoke felt like a dagger piercing my body. Do I know him? I asked. He runs the gardening company that operates in the neighborhood. He is a sole trader at the moment, but we want to expand the business together, she added as I remained silent. She had finally finished and just sat there, anticipating another question, no doubt, so she could crush me further. When I remained silent, she slid the papers towards me. Daddy and his attorney helped me to draft our divorce papers. I think it is a good deal for you, seeing as I paid the majority of the mortgage. Daddy recommended a 70 to 30 split in my favor for the house, which we can sell, as I will be moving in with Rich. I mean, I just let her. And she continued, I think a 50-50 split of our savings is only fair. And I will require no alimony, although I am sure I could fight for something if I wanted to. The arrogance and spite in her voice were now clear to me. How did I miss it all these years? I felt like a fool, and I guess she thought I always was one. Come on, let's be honest, Mikey. I make way more than you do, and my new man makes plenty too, so I won't touch your 401k if you sign the papers and don't fight me for anything. She suddenly stopped speaking as I looked her dead in the eye. She must have seen a glimmer of the old Mikey because she swallowed hard. I grabbed a pen and signed away 12 years of marriage. I rose from the table and went to her bedroom, packed up my possessions, and then returned. She was sitting at the table, reading through the paperwork as I walked past her through the door and out of her life. What? Joey screamed. Is she effing crazy? To me, Joey is family, and sadly, over the last few years, I have neglected him. But as true brothers, we can see past any transgressions and will always be there for each other in our time of need. As we spoke about what had happened, I could hear someone in the background, and Joey trying to silence them. Is that Helen? I asked. What is she saying? E, she said, good riddance to the stuck-up 304. Joey and Helen had what you call no filter. What you see is what you get. And boy, did I miss that. It's how I used to be. Hey, Mikey, I have a guy who Helen knows. Who does these investigations on debtors for local companies? I can get him to take a look into this guy for you. You know, see if the crap is legit and all, he asked in his usual brusque manner. I don't really care, Joey, I said despondently. This guy screws you over, steals your wife, and you just sit back and take it. If you Mikey, he said with his voice rising. That her and Joey must have realized it too. Sorry, bro, I am just as mad as hell. And I wish you were too, he said apologetically. It's okay, Joey. I mean, you are right and all. Do what you like, I said. I gave him the very few details I had on this new guy. He was the gardener for the neighborhood so it wasn't too hard to get some more information if Helen's guy wanted it. You need to get your head back in the game, Mikey, 
and return to your old self again, he instructed before we eventually hung up. After I put the phone down, I lay back on the cheap motel bed and stared at the ceiling fan whirring above my head. I tried to make sense of everything that had happened to my life, not only the last few hours, but the last 12 years. Sleep evaded me, so I made a grab for the bottle of Jack Daniels on the table and drank straight from the bottle. For the next few weeks, I did the same. Often I would call in sick at work or turn up drunk, the smell of booze leading me to be sent home. Everyone in the office was looking at me, snide comments made behind my back, and I felt like I was watching myself from above, just going through the motions of existence. I was recommended to a doctor, and although that helped, being signed off work gave me more time to think and dwell on the past. I never made it to the offices of Jones and Brown to finalize the divorce. A letter was sent to my office because nobody knew where I was, and nobody was going to bother looking. I knew that for sure. The letter contained the divorce settlement and a check for $175,000, my share of the house, savings, and house contents. The settlement declared everything Jessica said at the kitchen table, and as I had not attended the meeting, it was finalized in absentia. I had no idea if all of this was legal and above board, but I had no fight left in me, not enough anyway for Jessica and her powerful inner circle. A month had now passed since Jessica told me she wanted a divorce, and I had finally cashed the check into my account. I discovered all our other accounts had been closed, and Jessica had removed her name from our joint account. However, as I was walking aimlessly out of the bank, I heard a voice calling my name. I ignored it at first, but when I eventually turned to look, I saw Pete and Shelly, my old neighbors. Hey, Mickey, Pete asked, walking up to me. Sorry to hear about the divorce, he said nervously. Now, Shell, his wife, she was a nosy neighbor and loved to gossip, and it did not take her long to pipe up. I can't believe Jessica would leave you and remarry so quickly. I looked at her with surprise. I seemed to remember Jessica saying she wanted to marry the guy, but such was my state of mind at the time, I forgot about it. Oh, you did? No, Shelley continued. I had no idea, I said with an air of indifference. We thought you guys were the real deal, Peters said. Then we see she is married to this Richard Walton. It was the first time I had heard his full name, but as I looked at Shelley, she seemed to recoil and cringe at the mere mention of his name. I ignored it as I suddenly thought I now had a surname to give to Joey's friend rather than Rich, the gardener from Albany. He was the gardener who services your neighborhood, I said, offering information not asked for. As I did, I saw Peter swing around and face Shelley, who by now had turned bright red. A gardener. He yelled at Shelley, drawing stares from passersby. Why have you gone red? Shells? He asked. As I realized I had put my foot right in it. No, Peter. No. Never. Shelley pleaded. He tried it on with me once, and I put him in his place. Peter was now red himself and looking pretty angry. As Shelley continued, he is a sleaze, and every time he is due, I go out for a few hours to avoid him. I never told you because I knew you would be angry, she said, reaching for his hand and pleading with him. We need to talk, he said before turning to me and apologizing. He grabbed her by the hand and marched her off down the sidewalk. I guess that is one lost customer for Jessica and Richard's growing empire, I thought to myself, managing to raise a smile for the first time in a while. The news of the marriage did hit me hard. I slumped back into depression and reached for the bottle again. I thought I would have a good try at drinking myself to death. That way, all the pain would go, and I wouldn't have to continue with my pointless existence. The next morning, I rose from my motel bed and fell to the floor, vomiting all over myself. I had officially hit rock bottom. I crawled into the shower on my hands and knees and let the cold water rain down on me. As I emerged, I looked in the mirror, and what I saw reflecting back left me shocked. Fuck you. I shouted at the man looking back at me. I need to get better. I fell to my knees and cried for the first time since my mother passed away. I just want to be happy. I screamed into my hands. I knew something had to change. I walked into my office the following Monday and got down to some work. For some reason, my personal mail was on my desk. I guessed it was redirected there because nobody knew where I was living. As I read through what was mainly junk, I found a flyer for a local gym promising to get anybody in shape in 12 weeks. I snorted to myself, thinking it would take longer than that. But I thought, what the hell, maybe this was the change I needed. That evening, as I entered the gym, 
I had no idea what the beautiful young instructor standing before me would think of this soul has been at 38. I felt like an 80-year-old man, but as I stepped closer to her, she held out her dainty hand, which I gladly accepted. I'm Jasmine, she said. To say she thought I was a mess would have been an understatement. But within her beautiful brown eyes, I saw a semblance of hope for me. They seemed to inject some energy into me. Not lust or anything romantic, but honesty and compassion. So, over the next week, I managed to move out of the motel and sign a lease on a small studio apartment in the city, close to the gym. I decided to focus on my 12-week plan and see where life took me. I needed to lose around 50 pounds, and the best place to start was getting rid of all the unopened alcohol bottles amongst my belongings. I worked really hard over the following month. My life was nothing but work and the gym. Joey and Helen also managed to visit a few times, no doubt to check up on me more than anything. But by the end of the month, and with constant encouragement from Jasmine, I had already lost 14 pounds. The good thing about spending nearly every day in the gym was that I got to know Jasmine a lot better. She agreed to coffee one evening after my session, and I found out a bit about her life. She was raised by a single mother and was attending a community college to become a full-time fitness coach and nutritionist. She certainly knew her stuff, and I warmed to her even more. I told her about my recent divorce and my old life in the Bronx. I admitted to her that I hit rock bottom before signing up at the gym and meeting her. I tried my best not to come off as some desperate creep, but she was beyond her years in terms of compassion and emotional maturity. It wasn't until a few sessions later that I emerged from the showers and met her. I was blown away. Jasmine was talking to a woman who, at first sight, looked like her sister, Courtney. I know, but it is the truth. Jasmine saw me looking and walked over to me before I could turn and walk away. Michael, this is my mom, Rachel, she said, smiling as Rachel held out her hand. Our eyes met, and I felt a tide of embarrassment flood over me. My stomach nodded, and I was truly lost for words. The silence was now getting awkward. It means he likes you, mom, Jasmine said, laughing and saving me in the process. He's quiet when he likes someone, she added, as though she had known me my whole life. The truth is, I wasn't always a quiet, shy, and unassuming man. The years of what I now think to be emotional abuse will do that to you. Jasmine left us to collect her things as Rachel and I started to talk. When Jasmine returned, she invited me across the road for dinner. I hesitated at first, but her insistence made it hard to say no. I imagined that if she had a father, she would have him wrapped around her little finger. At dinner, Rachel was so warm and sweet. I could tell the apple did not fall far from the tree. As the evening progressed, I relaxed in their company. There was no need for a show or pretentiousness. Rachel joked around, putting me at ease. We briefly touched on our past, and I guess Jasmine filled her mother in on my life. Leaving that night, I felt better than I had in months. I even had Rachel's number in my phone after she insisted on sorting out the mess on top of my head. Reluctant at first, I capitulated, bringing the sweetest laugh from her. In the next couple of months, Rachel and I were inseparable. When we finally made love, the passion was intense and perfect every time. From then on, she was the only one in my mind, and finally, my heart beat for another woman. We took it slow, wanting to ensure our feelings were real and built on trust. I took her back to my hometown, where Joey and Helen fell in love with her immediately. In the kitchen, Helen pulled me aside and said, Now, this is the woman for you, Mikey. Do not let her go. I assured her there was no chance of that. Jasmine confirmed I was back to my ideal way. I was proud and grateful to Jasmine and Rachel for helping me get to this point. My new haircut, along with surrendering my beard, contributed to some of the weight loss. Rachel had convinced me to try a clean-shaven look once, jokingly saying she wanted to see my face. I laughed at that suggestion hoping she wouldn't be put off by the man behind the mask. Thankfully, she wasn't, and here I was on cloud nine, feeling like a weight had been lifted. I made my way to Rachel's house, feeling on top of the world. Walking through the door, I was met by a nervous and pale-looking Rachel. The look of worry gave me a sense of deja vu. What's wrong, baby? I asked nervously, feeling the familiar dread. We need to talk, she said suddenly, and the walls felt like they were closing in. Those familiar feelings and nausea attacked my senses. Okay, I said as Rachel took my hand and sat me down. Look, Rachel, if you're going to break up with me, 
Just do it quickly so I can get out of here, I said abruptly, and she recoiled in shock. No, honey, she replied, gripping my hand tighter and pulling me closer. I don't know how to say this because I don't want you to get mad at me. My feelings of dread are not about it. I am pregnant, she announced hesitantly. I was in shock. We remained silent for a few seconds as her beautiful face creased up, trying to gauge my reaction. I rose to my feet and walked a few steps away. Turning back to her, looking worried and on the verge of tears, I screamed at the top of my lungs while simultaneously jumping in the air with both fists raised. Her face lit up, joy springing back into her eyes. You're not mad? She asked, regaining her beautiful smile. How could I be mad? I'm going to be a daddy. I announced before taking her into my arms and kissing her passionately on the lips. We embraced each other for the next five minutes. I was the happiest man on earth. Over the next few days, Rachel, Jasmine, and I started looking for a house. Despite Rachel having little in savings, I had nearly $180,000 in the bank, more than enough to buy a house outright. In less than a week, we found a beautiful five-bed colonial in Pine Hills. It needed some renovation work, which put off other buyers, but with my construction experience, I was excited about its potential. Our offer was accepted, and we didn't need to take out a mortgage. The day we moved in, I got down on one knee and proposed to Rachel. It was fast, but I loved her so much, and she was the one for me. She accepted. I'd love to say that from there. We lived happily ever after, but that would skip over the reason I am sad here in this courthouse. Just to make it clear, I was not being charged with anything. Well, a couple of weeks after moving into our new home, I had a phone call from Joey. It was earth-shattering, to say the least. I had actually forgotten all about Joey asking Helen's colleague to look into my ex-wife's new husband, and to be honest, Joey did too. If this had been going on for months, I had no idea what it was going to cost me, and to be perfectly honest, I didn't even care to know what he had found out. Nonetheless, Joey was beside himself with glee and just had to tell me his findings. I remained silent as Joey began to speak. The whole thing is a house of cards, Mikey, he said, laughing. Helen's guy dug around, and after you gave us the full name, it set the wheels in motion. It turns out the IRS and the feds got involved. Hold on, I yelled, thinking I had missed a major chunk of the story. What do you mean the feds are involved? Just listen, Mikey, just you listen to this, he said, trying to calm me down. The gardening company he owns has Jessica listed as a director, and it is in serious debt. Mikey, I mean serious debt. And that is just for starters. The house he owns now has Jessica's name on the deeds, and it is worth over a million dollars, but the mortgage payments are made through a company called Ritual Enterprises. That company owns the house and the business. Jessica and Richard are listed as joint co-owners, and it began trading only six months ago, probably just after their wedding. I was trying my best to keep up, and I knew Joey was doing his best to relay what Helen had obviously told him. Helen's guy alerted the IRS, who, by the way, will be picking up his tab. I was pleased to hear I wasn't going to be stuck with a huge bill anyway. The IRS investigated Richard Walton and found out he is on their wanted list. They had a picture of him or something, so he is a fraud tur, I said, stating the obvious. Oh, you're right, Mikey, but wait until you hear what happened next, he said teasing me. Well, this investigation alerted the attention of some big corporate type in Charlotte, North Carolina, I interjected. Yep, Joey said excitedly. Well, his name is Davis Snan, and he has a daughter called Julia Reed. She is currently estranged from her husband, Kyle Reed. They have two kids together, and, okay, by now, I was seriously confused. Get on with it, Joey, I said exasperated. Stick with me, Kitty, he said breathlessly. It turns out Kyle Reed is Richard Walton. What? I screamed down the phone and Joey's ear must have been ringing, not that he would have cared. He was too busy laughing his ass off. Yeah, and they are still legally married. I think he is called a big mister something, but that is not the best of it, he said, leaving me hanging for more. This was beginning to sound like a Hollywood movie or something. Well, the FBI got involved, and it turns out the guy is a two-time felon. He has spent time inside for drugs and burglary. I think Mr. Nolan Mann managed to get him a reduced sentence for the second conviction. He is a powerful man, apparently. Anyways, the feds investigated him, 
In this, Kyle Richard guy made contact with another suspect they were looking into regarding drug trafficking crimes. My mind drifted back towards Jessica and her friends and family. I could just picture their faces at this size. I started to smile. There is more, Mikey, Joey continued. The FBI and the IRS joined forces and took this guy down. They found him at a storage unit not far from his home, and the answer to how a man in debt could afford a million-dollar house and a lavish lifestyle became all too clear. How, Joey? How? I was hooked. They found heroin, ecstasy, and stolen goods in his unit and his truck. They actually think he was about to flee again. He had suitcases filled with clothes and stuff in his truck. I started to laugh, and Rachel joined me on the sofa, shaking her head and laughing too. She had no idea what she was laughing at or what was making me so happy. So, what about Jessica? I asked, and Rachel swung around and glared at me. I put my hand over the receiver and whispered to her, You are not going to believe this, I said, shaking my head and leaving her hanging. Joey continued to speak as I returned the receiver to my ear. She was arrested. Her parents have somehow managed to keep it out of the media, but I expect over the next few days, they will be front page news. It is a big news story, after all, he said. I actually think Joey was more excited than I was because, quite honestly, any feelings I had for Jessica, ill or otherwise, were gone. I reached for Rachel's hand and held it just to confirm that fact. After I ended the call, I turned to Rachel with eager anticipation and told her everything. She was shocked and surprised because even though she knew Jessica was a complete itch, it never dawned on her that she could be a criminal. All I could think of was what her parents, family, and the so-called social elites thought of her. Poor old daddy had a duped criminal for a daughter, and that cannot go down too well at the country club. I had to laugh to myself, and Rachel knew what I was thinking and laughed along with me. A few days later, the front page of every newspaper in the area and every media news channel was covering the story. I guess Jessica's parents still had some leverage in the community because she barely got a mention. Of course, the bigamous drug trafficking conman was splashed all over our screens, but the female accomplice who moved in elite social circles and was well-known in the corporate financial world was not named. However, less than a week passed before one newspaper published the mugshot picture of them both, complete with prisoner numbers but no mention of Jessica by name. We did find out that Kyle Reed was actually 41 and not 35, as he claimed to be. So, my ex-wife actually left me for an older criminal who has just destroyed her life. Maybe she wasn't as intelligent as she thought. I was actually shocked at the image of my ex-wife. I had to take a few looks just to recognize her. She looked a shadow of the confident and arrogant woman who dumped me nearly eight months ago. She was gaunt and looked as though she had aged. Her hair was thinner, and she had huge, dark bags under her eyes. I looked up to see my beautiful pregnant fiancé who looked the complete opposite. I felt like the luckiest man alive, not only to have her, but to also be shot of my ex and her family. In the months that followed, the whole issue died down. We enjoyed our first family Christmas in the new house. Rachel's parents came to stay with us, Helen and Joey stopped by, and I was surprised to see a few of my old friends from my construction days get back in touch. I loved Rachel too, and it was they who talked me into getting back into the construction game. Rachel and Jasmine agreed with them and that's another reason I love them. In the new year, I quit my job and became a self-employed tradesman. I was working on construction sites but also doing small jobs in the community. Ironically, I also started to get a lot of requests to do gardening work in quite a few neighborhoods. I was even surprised to be contacted by Peter and Shelley, but only if I promised not to try anything on with Shelley. They had my word. In March, Rachel gave birth to our mixed twins, Alex and Sophia. In April, we were married in a small ceremony in Albany. It had been just over a year since the divorce from Jessica, and to think how much has happened in that time is astonishing. However, sadly, it would not be the last I would see of her. My new perfect life had been going so well until a visitor came knocking on my door completely out of the blue. His name was Andrew Brown of the law firm Jones & Brown, who was defending Miss Jessica Walker in her upcoming court case. I was surprised she had gone back to her maiden name. Surely, Mommy and Daddy wouldn't like the good walker name dragged through the proverbial mud. Mr. Brown made himself comfortable in my house as he spoke. We would like you to provide a good character testimony for Jess, I mean Miss Walker, he asked forthrightly. I laughed. Why would I do that? 
I replied. Well, before your divorce, you knew Miss Walker better than anyone. You know she is straight and would never get involved in anything criminal, right? I don't know if he was asking or telling me, but even I could see where he was going with this. What if he refuses? A voice behind me suddenly asked. Rachel emerged from down the stairs, obviously listening in on our conversation. Mr. Brown looked at me. What did my wife say? I proffered. Well, we can get a subpoena and force you to attend. If you still fail to show up, we can have you charged and thrown in jail, he said with a now menacing tone. My first reaction was to smash him in the face and throw him headfirst through the door, but as I looked towards my wife, I realized I had too much to lose. I had no idea if what he said was right or even legal, but for one court appearance, I acquiesced to his demands. So here I am, sat in the waiting room of the courthouse. The trial has been going on for a couple of days, and as my appearance sneered, I turned to Rachel. What do I say, honey? I asked with a whisper. She took my hand and looked at me with those beautiful brown eyes and said, You are the most honest and loving man I have ever known. Just be honest. I knew that what I said in that court would probably have no bearing on the case at all. I had been strong-armed into attending by my ex-wife's legal team. They had wrongly made the assumption that I would speak highly of her. It could be the biggest mistake they had ever made because I was going to do no such thing. A few days ago, the trial for Kyle Reed had concluded. He was found guilty of Class C bigamy, a federal charge of Schedule I drug possession with intent to supply, perjury, handling stolen property, and a whole range of charges relating to defrauding the U.S. government. He was also on a third strike. He was sentenced to 70 years in prison. Even I was shocked by that sentence. However, in an attempt to get a lesser sentence, he implicated Jessica on the fraud and handling stolen goods charges. He claimed she was in on it as they started the holding company as soon as they were married. What is it they say about no honor among thieves? The stolen property charges were being contested, but on fraud, the IRS had her all ends up. Mr. Green, we are ready for you, the bailiff declared. I rose to my feet and exhaled loudly. Rachel had left to join the public gallery, while Jasmine looked after the twins in the waiting room. They were sound asleep, oblivious to it all. In the court, my name was announced, and as I approached the stand, I could feel the eyes of the entire court on me. It was a strange atmosphere. There were a few gasps as I took the stand, especially from those sat behind the defendant. As I took the oath, I turned to face the room, and it was the first time in over a year that I had seen Jessica in the flesh. She was dressed in an orange prison uniform and surrounded on either side by an expensively put-together defense team. She was looking down at her feet, but I made eye contact with her parents and then a few of her friends who sat behind her. I made out a couple of people who looked at me and mouthed the word, wow. The irony of me now looking down on them from the witness stand was not lost on me. I spent our entire marriage with them all looking down on me. Now the roles have been reversed. Andrew Brown rose to his feet and began to speak. Thank you for coming today, Mr. Green, he said. Well, I wasn't given much choice, was I, Mr. Brown? I replied, staring down at him. He recoiled at my tone, and all eyes turned towards him to see what his reply would be. At that moment, Jessica finally lifted her head and looked in my direction. Her eyes flew wide open, and her jaw dropped. She suddenly burst into tears, causing everyone to turn and look. The realization must have hit her. The man she fell in love with had made a welcome return, and the man she had destroyed was gone. She was now inconsolable as the judge asked her lawyer if he needed to take a minute. He ignored his offer and continued. Mr. Green is the defendant's ex-husband, who was admittedly treated very well by my client in the divorce. Would you agree that the charges against her surprise even you? He asked. No objections from the prosecutor. I was very shocked, but being treated well in the divorce? I guess you and I have different ideas on that. I replied confidently as murmurs appeared from behind him. I am sure I could see Jessica's parents talking to one of the team as Jessica continued sobbing. Okay, Mr. Green, but would you say that in all the time you and the defendant were together, she was always an honest, hardworking, and law-abiding citizen? He asked. Well, she was cheating on me for four months with a man she described as younger, more attractive, and successful. So once again, we probably have our own definitions of honesty, I replied. I was beginning to think at that point her legal team realized they may have made an error here. Remember, he only threatened me to turn up, 
not paint a picture of a perfect, innocent woman. I was just being honest like Krell said I should be, but would you agree that in that time you neglected yourself physically and intellectually, so when someone better came along, could you really blame the defendant for moving on, he said. Truly, there was an almost universal chorus of disapproving moans from the public gallery and the prosecution bench, who obviously felt that at this point they were not really needed. The defense was digging my ex-wife's grave. The judge brought about order, giving me a chance to think about my reply. I agree that I neglected aspects of my life. It was very hard to live with someone who controlled my life and whose family and friends considered you beneath them. The defendant's father once referred to me as a good-looking dumb I said openly, and the look of shock and confusion amongst the defense was almost too hilarious for words. At this point, Jessica was just staring at me with pity in her eyes. I had none for her in return. That may well be, Mr. Green, but there is nothing to suggest that the defendant was ever involved in criminal activity. No evidence to suggest that for the years you were together, she was dishonest or looking to commit fraud. She paid her bills, even yours for a while, and never broke the law. Is that right? He said, now visibly flustered. Objection. The prosecutor rose to her feet. This is inadmissible, Your Honor. The witness is not here to prove the defendant committed no crime. It is a waste of the court's time. Sustained, the judge said. The defense can rephrase the question. Mr. Brown looked perplexed but cleared his throat and resumed his line of questioning. Mr. Green, in the years you were together, the defendant was an honest person who paid all her bills, her taxes, and her mortgage. She even paid yours for a time. Is that correct? He stated. Yes, I said, but I have no idea what type of person she has been over the last year. Well, I think we can take a guess, I said. Objection, Mr. Brown, he said, looking at the judge. What do you mean? Objection, Mr. Brown. He's your character witness, the judge said, trying not to laugh as half the courtroom burst into laughter. The jury had to look away. Your Honor, he is obviously a bitter ex-husband seeking revenge on the woman who dumped him and moved on, he said, now getting angry and irate. The defense team was now beside themselves with worry. Jessica was looking back between her parents and her counsel with tears running down her face. The judge spoke again. If he is a bitter ex-husband, then why did you put him on the stand? The prosecution team just sat back and smiled to one another. Is it true that you are indeed a bitter man who just wants to see his ex-wife suffer? Mr. Brown asked after a period of silence. If this had happened 11 months ago, you may have had a point, but now I have nothing to be bitter about. I may not be an intelligent man, Your Honor, but I am an honest man, please. Mr. Green, your wife, ex-wife, Mr. Brown, I interjected. Okay, your ex-wife leaves you for another man and you feel no bitterness or ill will towards her and her family? He probed. No, like I said, 11 months ago, maybe you could have implied that. But since then, I have found the most beautiful woman in the world, I said, looking over into the public gallery and straight at Rachel. People followed my gaze until all eyes were on her. She picked me up, put me back together, and now I get to call her my wife. She has given me three beautiful children. We have great friends, wonderful family, a beautiful home, and a successful business. Who in the world would be bitter with all that? I stated, never breaking eye contact with my beautiful wife, the smile never leaving my lips. She just looked back at me with that radiant smile, nodding her head. I turned back to see the defense looking tense, and now Jessica's parents were looking down at their hands. Jessica looked distraught and was sobbing as she caught my eye. I mouthed the words, thank you to her and she collapsed into her arms onto the table. I was dismissed, and I returned to my family. As I walked through the door, I could hear a big commotion with Jessica at the center of it. She was screaming, Sorry, I love you, but whether or not it was aimed at me, I do not know, and frankly, I did not care. Jessica was found guilty of conspiracy to commit an offense to defraud the U.S. government. I guess the court felt Kyle Reed was not smart enough to do it alone. I read it was titles 18 to 371, 26 to 7201, and 7206, 1 and 2. I had no idea what that meant. She was also found guilty of fifth-degree possession of stolen goods, which was a Class A misdemeanor. Apparently, she was sentenced to six years in prison. It also meant any chance of continuing her career in finance upon her eventual release was gone forever. First life is pretty great.
The twins are getting bigger each day, and their smiles can lift the clouds on even the darkest day, which I am pleased to say are few and far between. My business is booming, and even Rachel now has a few clients that visit our home for hair and beauty treatments. Jasmine is breezing through her final year of college, which I am now paying for, by the way. Well, it is the least I could do for her. She did save my life. Dear listener, if you have reached this far please click on the subscribe button. It will be a great help.